Good afternoon. Westminster Woods family and friends, Chaplain Leslie, bringing you our Sunday afternoon Vesper service for today, which is Sunday, August the 9th. I pray that this service will be a blessing to you. Um, in, in the preparation of it, it is a blessing to me. And so I share that with you all this afternoon. Thank you for coming and being part of this service. And so now let us center our hearts and minds to be in that prayerful spirit. Join me in prayer. No matter how strong the storm, God, no matter how threatening the waves, Jesus calls us to trust in his love, his love and his mercy. Rejoice in his goodness. Rely on his power in all things. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our call to worship this afternoon, I will lead us uh, in beginning that time, and then when we come to the part where you all join me, I will lift up my hands and you can repeat after me as we open with our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. We proclaim the marvelous goodness of our God. We proclaim the marvelous goodness of our God. Let our hearts leap for joy, O people of God. We proclaim the marvelous faithfulness of our God. We proclaim the marvelous faithfulness of our God. God's ways are not our ways. His works are too wonderful to behold. We proclaim the marvelous works of our God. We proclaim the marvelous works of our God. And all God's people said, Amen. Our opening hymn is I've Got Peace Like a River. We're having a water theme today um, with the opening one, I've Got Peace Like a River. The closing hymn will be Here I Am, Lord. And our scriptures this afternoon will come from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. If you would like to follow along with me, I'll be using the NIV, New International Version, this afternoon. So let's join in, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Amen. I like that one. It's very upbeat, which is gives me some positive feelings. And so I like that. That's a good one for us this afternoon. We come now to a time of prayer, the prayers of the people and also the Lord's Prayer. And I'll begin our time with uh, prayers that are for all of us and for our community, our world indeed these days. And then offer a moment of silence. I invite you when we reach that moment of silence to, to pause the video if you would like and take the time that you need to continue to be in prayer and then come back and we will all share and pray the Lord's Prayer out loud together. And so now if you would please join me once again in prayer. God of mysterious ways, you take our fears and turn them into triumphs. You remind us that you are always with us and that we do not need to fear the wind and waves of life. Encourage us to step out of the boat, 
to come across these difficulties to your redeeming and transforming love. Give us courage and strength, joy and peace for all the times ahead. Lord, hear our prayers on this day. Prayers for continued healing amongst each of your people at Westminster Woods for not only those who live and work here, but also to extend those healing prayers into the lives of other family and friends, indeed our community and our world today, Lord, to heal body, mind, and spirit. Be with each of us today, Lord. Bless us, we pray, as we delve into the scriptures, as we seek to find the word that you have for each one of us on this day. You know the needs of our hearts, and so we give them to you on this day. God, we recognize that we could take all day, truly all day, we could take days to be in places of prayer. And so we offer up a few moments of quiet so that we may continue to be in that prayerful spirit. And as we are in this prayerful spirit, God, we trust. We have all the assurance that we can muster that you hear our prayers and that you answer them. And now may we pray the prayer that you taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Hear these words of assurance of pardon. Keep your focus on Jesus. He is your Savior and your God. He will never fail you. Rejoice. Rejoice. We are called precious by our Lord. We are called precious by our Lord. Amen. Amen. So our scripture for today again comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Lord, for these images, these powerful images, we ask that you keep our hearts and minds open to your leading as we study your word. Amen. You might be familiar with phrases such as the following, in for a penny, in for a pound. Well, we've come this far. Don't quit now, you're halfway there. Familiar phrases, I am sure. They have come up many times in my own life. 
And we hear them, don't we, when we have begun some kind of a project, when we have invested ourselves in some kind of an event, and we fully intend to see this event to its completion, and then those bumps come along, don't they? Sometimes maybe they're little ones, maybe they're, maybe they're a series of big ones. And the thought comes to mind, well, maybe this wasn't the right time for this project. Maybe I didn't hear God correctly. Maybe, maybe I need to put this off to the side and try again another time. And we can feel stuck, can't we? We can feel fearful, fearful and anxious and left wondering if maybe, maybe we should stop. Maybe we should not see that project to its completion. And yet, there's another part of us, perhaps, that says, we've made a commitment. We've made a promise. We've already spent time and effort, maybe financial resources, signed a contract even. If we believe in what we are doing, perhaps the part of the point is that we expect that there be setbacks in this project, that we might tell ourselves, well, maybe if we stay in, we can work through these setbacks. So let's keep going. Let's see what we can accomplish. My husband and I like to watch some of these drama shows where, uh, for instance, one is called Deadliest Catch. Maybe you all are familiar with that one. The drama comes when the owner of, of a large fishing boat uh, has his crew with him and they go out into very deadly waters to catch these elusive crab that um, bring a lot of money. But along the way is the risk. And the risk is injury. Almost always uh, the people who are part of these crews get injured in some, in some fashion. And so that's a big risk. Equipment fails. Uh, being that it's a boat, um, there's, uh, you know, electrical equipment that might fail. There might be the motor itself that goes, that goes bad. And while there are parts on the boat, sometimes they even have to come back um, into uh, shore in order to get things repaired. And that sets them back because they've made a big commitment that they're going to go out and catch so many pounds of these crab. And they miss a lot of family events making this commitment. There's a lot of sacrifice involved. And so they understand um, that once you, once you start, once you're in it, and you're way out there at sea, it's kind of hard to just say, no, nah, I think I'm, I'm done. I want to go back. Once you're in it, you have to continue and complete the, the trip. And, and the payoff, again, is, is the large monetary um, payment that comes when they sell the crab at the end of the trip. And so it's kind of an interesting show, but it, 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 it illuminates these ideas that sometimes when we get started on things, it doesn't guarantee that there's not going to be bumps, but we make a commitment. And so we see it to completion. If we think of commitments, the disciples in a way have made a commitment, haven't they? They've left families, they've left businesses, they've left loved ones, and they have chosen to follow Jesus. It would appear that they've been in for a penny, so they're in for a pound. And they, they're kind of on the verge of understanding that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. At least they think that they believe that he's the Son of God, that he would never lead them astray. And yet, and yet good old Peter, he does the very kinds of things that we maybe have done or, or think about doing in times of fear, in times of utter chaos in our own lives. Maybe there's been a time when we have doubted that God is truly the one who's in control. That's the story of God we, we imagine is going to work for good, but sometimes we're not sure. Especially when we don't have enough light in the story to see what the next chapter is going to bring. We can understand that. And at first, Peter is like the others and believes Jesus to be a ghost, some kind of an evil spirit. And that was a common understanding of water, of lakes and rivers and the ocean, not understanding what really might be there. So it was a place of fear. And so to think of Jesus as perhaps a ghost or some kind of evil apparition was not an uncommon belief in the early days of Jesus. 
what strikes me as, as somewhat humorous is the fact that even when Jesus identifies himself and tells them that they don't need to fear, Peter still doesn't quite believe that it's him. It seems to me that if Jesus were to tell me not to fear, and that that really is him and he's present, that I should listen. But not so with Peter. His initial reaction is, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you, and then I will know that it's you. Telling me isn't quite enough. You've got to invite me to come to you. So there is doubt in Peter's heart, even before he steps over the side of the boat, even before he gets one toe in the water, there is doubt. Peter also wanted proof that it was Jesus, didn't he? Much like Thomas wanted to put his hands, touch the nail marks in Jesus's hands. So too with Peter, he wants proof that it really is Jesus and not some apparition. Apparently he believes that if it is Jesus, the one who is walking on the water, then if he walks to him, Jesus will protect him, will keep him from drowning, will allow him to take that, to take those steps to get from the boat all the way out to Jesus. But Peter doubts and he becomes fearful and we know as he takes his eyes off Jesus and realizes what it is that he's doing, he loses his focus and he begins to sink. Now there might be those who would think that the, the highlight, the climax, that the pinnacle of the story is Peter's lack of faith and Jesus' subsequent rescue of him. And while that is indeed a very important part of the story, and that Peter does learn a valuable lesson to have faith, to not doubt, to not be afraid, to not take his eyes off Jesus, to trust in Jesus. And that when Jesus is in the midst of our chaotic lives, we should trust that he is not going to fail us either. And that there are consequences when we do take our eyes off of him. But there's more to the story than Peter's faith. And that part of the story, I think, has to do with Jesus' identity. It has to do with the power he has over creation, the power that comes to him because he is the Son of God. The power that he has to meet us in the chaos and to subdue the chaos as the wind, he caused the wind to die down when he and Peter got back into the boat. If we look at the story in that way, then really the end of the story, or the end of what we are lifting up this afternoon, becomes the climax, or the pinnacle of the story. The last two verses, 32 and 33, I'll share again. And when they climbed into the boat, that is Peter and Jesus, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when Jesus identifies himself and says, it is I, he is really saying, in essence, not just it is I, but I am. He is the I am, the same I am that spoke to Moses long ago. The same God who is the, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The I am. And when we think of Jesus in those terms, perhaps Peter's feeble attempts to walk on water seem even more feeble, especially in light of the fact that he and the other disciples are in the presence of the Son of God. So it makes me wonder, what can we learn perhaps from this story that might strengthen our own relationships with God through Christ? Perhaps that even in the worst of times, God is always faithful and steadfast. And he certainly does not need our feeble attempts to demand proof that he is who he is in order that he should somehow demonstrate his greatness. We need not fear. We need not doubt. We need only follow him and his greatness, his power, his majesty, his mercy, his grace, his love, his compassion, his whole character of God will shine all on his own. When we hear Jesus tell us that he is here and we need not fear, do we believe him? Or do we ever manage to think that, well, we can, we can do it okay without Jesus? Hmm. Notice that Jesus makes the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead. He's setting them up for a very powerful teaching moment. 
they probably didn't know that soon they would need to place all of their trust in him to protect him from the waves and the rough water. But Jesus was there. And they recognized in those moments, they had a realization, they named in this gospel, in Matthew's gospel, they named him as the Son of God. I like to think that just as he did for Peter, Jesus reaches out to us in the same way when we need him. But the story doesn't end with the rescue, does it? It ends with praise and worship and acknowledgement of who Jesus really is. And in that knowledge, takes the next part, takes the next part of the story for the disciples, sets up the next part of the story. And I believe he does that for us as well. Amen. Lord, thank you for these moments when we can perhaps become a little more enlightened with the story that you have for us and how we are part of your story and how not only are you there for us, but you truly are the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Our next and final hymn is I the Lord of Sea and Sky. Another uh, title you might be familiar with is Here I Am Lord. I'm going to just read the words for just a moment. I the Lord of Sea and Sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Let's hear it in song. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright, who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Amen. I will hold your people in my heart. If you call me God, I will go. Let us close our time together this afternoon with our benediction. I thank you once again for joining me for this time of worship. I pray an additional blessing upon each of you as you make your way through this week 